This episode of the AVIC podcast is brought to you by the Aesthetic and Beauty Industry Council. Hello and welcome to the AVIC podcast, your online support community for the aesthetic and beauty industry. Here, we're strengthening and unifying the industry through representation, innovation and education. This is a platform created and dedicated to the aesthetic and beauty industry, valuing unity and advancement. We serve to represent, support and inspire you by connecting you with industry experts, expanding your knowledge through educational pieces and bringing you the latest industry news. This is the AVIC Podcast. I'm your host, Stephanie Miller, and today's guest is Selena Tomasich from HairAid. Selena is an academic with a teaching career spanning more than 20 years. Selena teaches business, specifically entrepreneurship, law, human resource management, and marketing. Selena describes herself as a dedicated nerd with a passion for education and learning. Selena holds five university qualifications, including a doctorate of law. She holds an international patent for creating online technology, and she has created eight apps, written academic books, and is published in peer-reviewed journals. Selena has taught at the University of the Sunshine Coast, University of Queensland, QUT, as well as international universities. Selena is also the founder and CEO of HairAid, an Australian-based charity that is doing amazing things both internationally and right here in our own Australian communities. HairAid provides livelihood skills training for women recused from the sex trade, drug lords and those that live in critical poverty, teaching hair cutting and beauty service skills. Once trained, the people she helps can earn money and create a pathway out of poverty. In Australia, HairAid conducts community cuts events, providing free haircuts and beauty services to those that need a hand up. Here to discuss how beauty services play a role in empowering individuals and communities from HairAid, today we welcome Selena Tomasic. Welcome to the podcast, Selena. How are you today? Oh, I'm a little jet lag. Did you know that I just jumped off a plane from Cambodia? I did not know that. And wow. Yeah, but I'm pumped. I'm always pumped. I'm always energetic. So thank you for having me. You're so welcome. Oh my goodness. We are very excited to have you today because what you're doing with Hair Aid is something truly special. Please, Selena, tell us who are you and where, where did you start on your huge journey in Hair Aid? Sure. So my name is Selena Tomasich and I'm the founder and CEO of Hair Aid. And I'll quickly confess that I'm not a hairdresser. And um, and I know too that I'm not speaking here to hairdressers. I'm speaking to beauticians as well. So I want to share what Hair Aid is, but I'm also going to sneakily invite some uh, beauticians um, and cosmetology students as well um, to maybe participate in Hair Aid. So very quickly, Hair Aid does two things. Firstly, we go overseas and we work in developing countries in their streets community, in their slum community, inside men's and women's jails. And we teach five basic haircuts. And with this skill, this free training that Hair Aid provides, we gift all participants that complete a free toolkit. So a pair of scissors, four clips, a cape, And if we've got enough, a water bottle each in a tiny little bag and they can create a business. Now, also alongside that, we are always asked, can you please teach manicure, pedicure? Can you please teach facials? (laughs) I hear a beauty aid in the future. Yes. Well, I already have that name trademark. So, yes. (gasps) Um, But we've already done that uh, throughout uh, the men's and women's jails, you know, in the countries that we go to. So we go to Cambodia, where I've just returned from, Thailand, Indonesia, Philippines and Guatemala. So we've been doing this for 11 years and uh, we've trained. Now, I'm giving you figures that I haven't actually added up from Cambodia yet. 6,700 and probably another 140 that we trained just last week. 
Um, so we're getting really close to have trained 7,000 people around the world. So that's the first thing Hair Aid does. But the other thing that Hair Aid does here in Australia is we um, do Hair Aid community cuts. So we have 87 locations in Australia where we get volunteer hairdressers every six weeks to donate two hours of their time. And we work with communities, soup kitchens, churches, Orange Sky Laundry, Zonta clubs, um, people in need, youth mental health, friends in jail. So sometimes as our friends are, are leaving jail to go on to their next chapter, they're looking for jobs so that we help with fresh haircuts so they can go to interviews and such. We go you do migrants, Indigenous groups, and we just give a free haircut. So around Australia, we do around 20,000 free haircuts a year um, through our community cut. So that's what Hair Aid is. Two things, our international projects and our community cuts here in Australia. You have just blown my mind. For starters, <laughs> what an incredible project. I mean, we all know the absolute profound effects that grooming and looking after your physical self has on our mental well-being. That alone, to do it even for a small group of people is just life-changing. But the numbers that you've just told me they're astronomical. Selena, how do you do this? Uh, look, I do it because I'm passionate about it, but I also have a year and a half ago, I um, put my hand up and said, I can't do it all alone. Is there anyone in our team that, you know, would like to help us? So I've got a beautiful team of six volunteers in here in Australia that help me with hair aid community cuts now. And they're basically each state and territory they look after. So someone looks after North, New South Wales, someone looks after Victoria, someone looks after Western Australia, blah, blah, blah. And they've relieved uh, me of quite a bit of work because there's a lot of work. We've got six, 700 volunteers that do community cuts every six weeks, which is amazing. And there's a lot of work. Behind I'm just this thinking event. about the scheduling, um, incredible scheduling nightmare that you'd have to coordinate 600 staff, basically, for volunteers. So Oh, I know. Thank you for that. I, I do say to people, it's like I run 87 little pop-up salons every six weeks at a different location with a different set of staff, with different timings, with all the impacts that life gives you. What I will say is it's because of the strength of our volunteers and not just our coordinators that help me with that, but the volunteers themselves that give up two hours every six weeks. And sometimes that doesn't sound like much. And I actually use that as a bit of a marketing tool. It's only two hours every six weeks. And we never do anything over December or halfway through January because that's the crazy time for salons and clinics, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it really means by the time you get rid of public holidays and things like that, that's about 16 hours a year I'm asking for. But still, in our busy lives, oh, yes. that's a lot. You know, every six weeks. I need to make sure that I head over to the local soup kitchen or church or the, you know, some of our volunteers get up at five o'clock in the morning to make the breakfast shift at some of the soup kitchens. And some people go to the Friday night ones in the middle of Brisbane. And some people go to the youth mental health ones in Melbourne where they just need a little bit extra care. And we work with Ronald McDonald houses where critically ill children are. And that takes, you know, your emotions as well as your time. So look, um, I'm passionate about what Hair Aid does for the community. And you're right. When you had a fresh cut, I oh, know myself, someone someone gives me a haircut and my shoulders go down and my head goes up a little bit and I sneak a little look in the mirror when I walk past because I feel better. And for people that we reach out to at a community cut, sometimes we're the only people they speak to every six weeks. That's so, I mean. Sometimes they're we're the only connection. It's hard. It's heartfelt what you do really. And it is, goes beyond a simple haircut. I mean, people think volunteer two hours, give somebody a haircut, but it's just such a deeper meaning and deeper connection that you can have with someone when you're physically touching them. And we know that in the beauty industry, because inherently in beauty and aesthetics, that's what we do. We touch people. Um, yes. And even that short amount of time, half an hour, 20 minutes with someone and you're giving them your energy, your wonderful, positive healing energy, because you're doing something kind and wonderful and restorative for them, gives them energy that not just lasts them that day, it can last weeks, honestly. I mean, a good haircut can last a little while, right? Yeah. And, you know, we also do, just like you've said, it's that time and it's that connection. So often where we have beauticians that can help us out, we'll do little mani-penny 
petty sessions, you know, in the parks and things like that. And it's, it's sometimes just that stopping and spending time with somebody um, and you watch their eyes sparkle and you watch them like really connect. And I love it. Like I go to as many community cups as I possibly can, you know, in my locations or if I'm flying around Australia, I get to the other ones. And I watch our guests, as we call them, the, the homeless or the couch surfers or the, the, you know, the car dwellers, whatever, wherever their spaces are. I watch and they'll, they'll wait for their, and they'll say, I'm sorry, I'm just waiting for my hairdresser. I'm oh, waiting, you know, they make these really beautiful relationships, no different to us with our hairdressers. And then hairdresser, you know, they remember them and they say, how have you been, Trevor? What's going on? And they're like, oh, I did this, I did this. And sometimes we hear beautiful stories like, yeah, oh, look, I felt good enough. I rang my mum or, um, you know, I've gone back home to see the family or there was a birth in the family. I went and saw the baby because they feel that they are acceptable to do those things or they've gone to the doctor and they've, you know, checked, um, had a revision on their medication or they've um, reached out to a medical practitioner or they've, you know, used the free services of the dental clinic or they've gone for a job interview or they've got a house or like there's just so many things that a powerful persona of feeling a little bit more fantastic can do for you. So, yeah, you're right. The, the power of a fresh haircut, I call it. Can I just tell you the passion, the love in your voice and, and the true joy when you're explaining what you do, it just comes through in every single word that you say. And I know I feel the same way about my industry. I feel the same way when I talk about, you know, the great things that we're doing for the professionals in our industry, helping them because, you know, there are so many struggles in our industry as well. And, it, you know, everybody experiences hardship. You know, we've got business owners and professionals that, that are experiencing hardship. You're, you know, going at a, at a different level, obviously, with what you do. But whenever you decide to help or, I suppose, crusade for a cause, there's something inside us that just clicks over and says, we can help. We can, we can make a change here. Tell us about you and when that moment sort of culminated and and inspired you to create this wonderful project so it's a it's a great story it's, it's a marketer's dream the story of hair because I'm not a hairdresser I'm actually a university lecturer by trade so I teach I'm a bit of a nerd I'm, I'm this far off my finishing my PhD even though I'm oh wonderful and you know what I, you were speaking I'm like this is a born presenter right here <laughs> Well, you know, I've had I've had the pleasure of uh, teaching at universities for more than twenty five years, and in education. So education is everything for me. I love I love what education can do. And just because I teach at university doesn't mean that I think university education is, the, you know, where you need to be. Become a florist. Become a baker. Learn how to fix a, a, a motorbike. Um, learn from your grandfather how to preserve f fruit and vegetable. Like that's education. Everything's education. And education changes your life. Like it doesn't matter whether it changes your job prospects or whether education and knowledge changes something you find something passionate about that sends you off on a new space that just fills another part of your life, another bucket in your life. So the story of Hair Aid is my husband is a police officer. I'm an academic and we're probably bad parents because as soon as the kids were old enough in their teens, we used to pop off overseas for a month and explore a new country. Now, we don't have a lot of money, so we used to flash pack, okay? So that's like backpacking, but you stay at a better hotel. <laughs> I love that, flash pack. Is that a yeah. real term or did you call no, it? I made that up, so I love it. Yeah, TM <laughs> to Selena, um, trademark. Um, so we were like, we had planned to go to Japan. And the nuclear explosion happened, so no flights were allowed in. So the airline basically said, you've got a credit, choose another country or go somewhere else. So we ended up in the Philippines. And I love the Philippines. Um, and we were back, flash, back, flash packing through there for like, you know, four weeks. And it was time to come home. And on the last night, we're in Metro Manila, so in the main part of the city. And my hubby goes, I want to watch the footy. So we had to find an Australian pub that was playing the football. So we Googled Australian pubs and we found this little one called Outback Jacks. Uh, came complete with a stuffed crocodile and Vegemite toast on the menu, right? And that. it was a tiny little pub and we went on in and we're from Queensland and unfortunately the AFL was playing. What is that game? And we were waiting for the NRL to play. But you know what? We're an Australian pub. There's cold beer and there's some sort of footy on the TV, so we're happy. 
And then after a few moments, two ladies walked in and one was Canadian, one was Australian. Obviously from the accents I could tell. I'm a have a chat. I love talking to people. I love finding out their stories, their life. And so I just said to them, hey, how are you? Where are you from? What are you doing? Are you traveling? You know, do you live here, work here? And the academic Canadian said, I'm an academic. I teach at university. And I'm like, so do I. That's just the strangest conversation. And I'll never have another moment in my life like that. The stranger thing was she taught the same subjects as I do in business, entrepreneurship and law. And I was like, wow. So we were having a lovely chat. And then I said to the other lady, what do you do? And she said, I work for an organisation that collects the children from the street. and We keep them safe. I'm like, what do you mean you collect them from the street? She said, well, the parents leave them there because they're too poor to feed them. And they leave them there hoping that an NGO or a charity or an adoption agency will collect the children and give them a better life. But the reality is the drug runners, the mafia, the prostitution gangs, they collect these children. They, they get these abandoned children and they do the most horrible things to them. Over 11 years, I've heard the worst stories. They maim them. They throw acid on them. They take their eyes out. They cut a limb off so they'll make better beggars on the street. They'll put the girls in prostitution. They'll take them away from their family, their culture. Sometimes they take them across borders so they don't even have their own language to speak to anyone, to ask for help, to try and escape. And they keep them there. And when they're done at 15, 16, 17, when they're bent and broken and destroyed and drugged, they throw them out in the streets so they, or they sell them to um, remote farmers, the Chinese farmers, and then they become sex slaves and work slaves for them. It's a horrible scenario. So I said, I hadn't, didn't, hadn't they had that in-depth conversation while we're sitting at the pub, but she was just saying how they collect the children at this stage. And I said, well, what do you do with them? Are you, are you an orphanage? She said, no. She said, what we do is we try and reconnect the child back with the family. So after, they look after their medical needs, they feed them, they give them a new set of clothes, they look after their spiritual needs because it's a Catholic society over there. And when the child feels comfortable and they find out where they live and what their parents' names are, they take them back to their province, find the parents and say, we've got your child. Did you realise that they could have been taken away, used for prostitution, drugged? And the parents don't know that. They actually think that they're doing something good for the children. And they give the children back to the parents. Now, I teach business and I was like, you didn't, you didn't help. You didn't solve anything. You're going to be picking that kid up again in six months' time. They're still too poor to feed them. And she said, but we work with the parents and we give them a livelihood skill. And then if they can earn some money, they won't have to give up their children. And I'm like, I like that. Can you imagine? I've got three kids. Can you imagine ha having to line my three kids up or me? That's what went through my head at that moment. Could I line my three kids up and choose which one I would leave on the street because I'm too, too can't feed them? Like I couldn't. And I was like, how can I help? Now, the fun part of the story is the two ladies that walked into the bar were actually nuns undercover who'd snuck into the bar to have a beer and watch the footy. So Sister Kate and Sister Claudia, as it turns out, I said to them, I love what you do, but what do you teach the parents? Because education, right? And she said, Sister uh, Kate, who's Australian, said to me, oh, we're no bloody good at it. She said, but we'd love to start a sewing centre. Now, you don't know me, but in my previous life before I was an academic, I was an interior decorator and I owned one of the biggest soft furnishing companies in Australia and I can sew and I can teach people to sew. So I went back to the university I was at and I said, hey, kids, I'm going to start an international business. I'm going to start a sewing centre in Manila. You want some experience while you're studying your degree? Come with me. So we did. We went back. We took a couple. We took six donated sewing machines. We took a ton of fabric, some seamstresses, some university kids, and myself and my husband. And we went back and we taught 17 people how to sew and they had a living. And then so I sister, said to Sister Kate, Sister Claudia and Father Luke, who we met along the way because he, he ran the centre where the children were kept safe. Do you want me to do that again? He said, yes. So we went back. On the second year, by this stage, I'd been out to the slums. I've seen the devastation, the critical poverty these people live in. And we think we know it when we see it on the TV or in movies, but we do not. We need to walk along in those slums and see the devastation where these people live. It is critical poverty. So I said to Brother Luke, what else do you need? 
And he said, hair cutting. And I went, why? Because well, I'm a business person, right? I want to know why. I don't do things for fun. And he said, because over here it's against the law for children to go to school if they don't have a regulation school haircut. Now, blow me away, but against the law? So people who are living in critical poverty, who are doing everything possible to send their kids to school to better their life, if their kid's hair grows, they can't send them to school. Now, I'm going to ask you a question, right? Are you ready? You're a family and you've got 50 cents left. Do I get your kid's haircut or do I buy food to feed my family? What do they do? You tell me what you think they do. Which one? I mean, I would probably choose the food. They don't. They don't? Because they know how education is their only hope. So the family starves and they get the kid's haircut and they to get keep them in school. And I'm like, perfect business model. Hair keeps growing. I can teach hair cutting. Well, of course I can't teach hair cutting. I'm not a hairdresser. <laughs> So I came back to Australia and I put a little tiny ad in the paper, our my local paper here on the Sunshine Coast in Queensland. And we're 11 years later and we've had, I don't, well, we just did our 53rd international project. The first time I think we taught 12 people how to cut hair. Next time, and we were still teaching sewing. Next time, I think we stopped sewing because the sewing centre had gone off on its own world. And it's still there today teaching people, which is great. But now, you know, we're nearly up to 7,000 people that we've trained. We're in five different countries. We go into the men's jail, the women's jails. We work in slums. We work in community centres. We work in protected locations. We've changed lives on a scale that you can't even imagine. In five days, we can teach people five basic haircuts and we gift that training for free and we gift a toolkit for free. So you have to, we actually have a very strict policy. You have to demonstrate to us that you can cut hair. If, you, if anyone wants to jump into our Facebook, you'll be able to see the work that these people create in five days' time. It's amazing. Um, and once they've done that, we give them a free toolkit. So they have the skills and they have the tools. And we work with credible partners overseas so that when we, our teams leave, they've got a support system. So they bring them back every week. And they can start a micro business immediately and start earning money and feeding their family. The Aesthetic and Beauty Industry Council is Australia's peak industry body, representing the collective professional beauty and aesthetic salon, clinic and spa community. Created for the industry, by the industry, our council is a collaboration of industry leaders who bring their commitment and specialised skills to raise industry standards, guide regulation and be a strong voice to government. At ABIC, our purpose is to provide an accessible and supportive organisation for the betterment of the professional beauty and aesthetic field, to enhance working practices and promote unity across the various sectors of the industry. ABIC's mission also includes being a trusted source of referral, education and guidance for clients of the beauty and aesthetic profession. ABIC is here to support our members through an extensive offering, including hundreds of valuable resources, HR support and industry expert facilitators to ensure your continued growth and success. Join us today and together let's safeguard the future of the beauty and aesthetic industry. Find us at www.theabic.org.au. At ABIC, we are here for you. So it's quite simplistic when you think about it. But there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes to be able to go into all these different countries and work with the government and MOUs and all that sort of stuff. So, but can I add in here too, we also do the manicure or pedicure. When we go into the women's jail in um, Cebu, uh, Philippines, we're going there like in six weeks time. We've had a call out for manicure pedicure training in the men's jail. We usually do women's jail, yes. but in the men's jail, they've said, hey, can we, we've got 40 men waiting to learn manicure, pedicure. So it's not just hair that we do because these skills, I'm going to say, are easily taught because we don't teach them at the level that Australians or developed countries are being taught, right? Mm -hmm. Not teaching them to be full-blown hairdressers. We're not teaching them to be full-blown um, you know, beaut beauticians. We're teaching them basic skills so they can earn money quickly and their skills um, will grow. So that's 
hair raid. Two nuns walked into a bar, hair raid happens. Um, we're all around the world and we rely on the power and the passion of the volunteers coming along and helping us. When you said you loaded what you've just described to us with this is a marketer's dream, the story is incredible. It is everything that you want to hear out of, out of a, you know, a feel good story. But whilst you were speaking, I was thinking to myself, the heartache that you must have seen, the struggles that you must have been through, everything to get to where you are, you sound so positive and happy and full of energy. But there must have been obstacles along the way, there must have been some kind of struggles, setbacks, challenges, if you will, share with us some of those roadblocks to getting where you are today i never see a barrier i can tell <laughs> for you know those just that do tell us what a barrier looks like for you you know what the, but tell me no and i'll i'll show you how to do it there are challenges along the way because we're working in you know developing countries and i've got to get official mous from governments and congresses for yeah. us to walk in we don't just rock on up to a jail and go hi we've got some sharp scissors let us in with all your prisoners please you know what i can't cut it I can't do, I can't do manicure, pedicure. Well, I can, you know, I've been on enough projects and know how to do it. But my role, my job is to do all the stuff behind the scenes. And I am CEO and founder, but I also jokingly tell everyone I'm the secretary of Hair Aid. I do all everything that needs to be done behind the scenes because that's what I can do. That's my skill set. I can project manage. I, you know, I've been in business my whole life. I've had my own businesses. Um, I've, I worked full time just so that everybody knows and we, it's very clear that I don't get paid for Hair Aid. Um, I never have and I never want to. I've always had my own paid job, which has been in academia alongside it. So I'm happily working my 60 to 70 hours a week there. And I'll happily put in 40, 50 hours to hair aid over the last 11 years because I love what I do and I love what it can do and change lives. And I, know, and I also know if I do my job well, then it's a it's the vehicle that others can volunteer on. Mm. You know, every people do want to help. Like oh, people don't say no, but sometimes they've got their own barriers that come through, you know. I mean, there's so many stories I can share with you and like they're heartbreaking. I can tell you the story of the lady. I have two main stories I tell. I'm going to share the story of the lady we were in. I was actually with uh, Katarina de Blase. You may know her. She's in the hair industry and she was on a hair aid project. We we're working in this little community called Passio and I was her 2IC because sometimes we need extra hands. We so had something like 30 people were supposed to come along and learn how to cut hair. And I think 50 turned up, which is not unusual. And we were there and on Monday we had this group of people and I'm walking around and helping behind the scenes and trying to get to know them and build trust quickly because we're only there for five days. And there's a lovely lady there and she was trying very hard. She wouldn't, she was never going to be a superstar, but she could cut hair decently. So she'd be able to earn a living. And then um, she was there on Tuesday as well. So I remember popping around saying hello to everyone like I do. And, um, uh, and then on Wednesday she didn't turn up. And now that's not unusual. Like, you know, these people have to go without income for five days to come and learn with us. And when they're already starving, that's a big gig. Um, and, you know, some or sometimes they have a one day a week job or sometimes their kids are sick or like a thousand reasons. So she didn't turn up. And on Thursday she turned up and I greeted her at the door. I'm like, hello, I missed you yesterday. Are you OK? What happened? And she said, I'm sorry, my son died. What did I miss? He starved. And of course, like, you know, she, she had four children and um, she had two sons and twin daughters and she was doing everything she could to put the two boys through school because over there it's still a, a gender difference of um, male, female. So she's trying to get her sons educated. But to earn, live, earn a living, she um, her twin daughters, because they were twins, earned more money prostituting. So that was the income that their family lived on. Um, and that is not an unusual story over there. They sometimes have to send their children out to prostitute to earn money to keep the family alive and she was learning hair cutting so that could stop and so she very matter-of-factly just said to me I'm sorry my son died what did I miss and like he died the night before and I was just like you know got my game face on because I have to and I went over to Katarina I'm like so Katarina see that lady over there we're staying later this afternoon we're catching her up and like Katarina was like looking at my face and Katarina knows me enough that I can be pretty strong 99% of the time, but she was looking at my face and she's like, no problem. Um, and we did, we stayed behind and we caught her up and she graduated and she cuts hair now. She cuts hair out of her slum house 
um, and all her children, remaining children in school, the girls are in school. Well, they've graduated now, they're older, but they were 12 years of age at that time. And, um, you know, like things like that are just, you know, it's heartbreaking. But yeah, along the way, the challenges, you know, they're just, what do you need me to do? And I'll do it because the value of what we do is so important to the world. And so, yeah, pretty motivated still after 11 years. And I'm speechless. One thing that I do want to say is how can we help? How can the beauty and aesthetic community help you? Because the stories you've just given us, I'm sure everybody listening right now is feeling the same way I do and the same way you did when you heard this is we just want to help. Yeah, you're right. Everybody does want to help in different ways. So, you know, one of the ways the beauty industry can help is come on a project with us. Now, volunteers do have to pay their own way and we are a charity so you can fundraise to do that but we are off as much as I'm asked to do um, hair which is all the time we're asked to do manicure pedicure and um, you know basic facials so anyone who wants to come on a project with us please jump on our website www.hairaid.org.au we're the only hair aid in the world Um, I answer all emails so if you send me through an email you'll actually truly get a reply from me Um, but we are often asked as I said we're heading to um, Cebu in the Philippines in six weeks time and I've got people who want to learn nails you have to go into a jail but you're going with a you know a group of people with the hairdressers and all the rest of that thing and it is safe trust us Um, we've set up the relationships and the everything with the government officials and everything so we do go in there safe and a way to give back like you change lives like you don't even understand I'll share a very quick story from the Philippines recently we're going to the males men and women's jails in the Philippines but we're in in this particular males jail a couple of years ago and we can only train about 40 people at a time okay and um, so these people are selected if you know they have to show passion they have to be good prisoners and they have to be leaving soon that was our criteria that they were leaving soon because we want them to learn and go out and earn because as soon as you leave jail over there that's a it's a kick out the bum out off you go and bad luck and often you've been you're not allowed to return home because your families don't want to know you it's very difficult uh, to you know get find an income and all of a sudden you're back on the streets and you've got no food and everything so the first thing you do is steal or you prostitute or you sell drugs because that's the only way you know how to earn a living so we want people to leave and then um, go and earn so there was one gentleman in this particular jail and he hadn't been chosen for that for the haircutting this year and he was released and he wanted to be a barber he always wanted to be a barber so mm-hmm. when he found out the hair raid was coming back he went to the jail and said can I please come back into jail so I can do the hair raid training and they like no you cannot but what they did because he was a good prisoner um, and had so obviously had a good reputation and character the he he was allowed back in so he walked eight hours to come to training and slept outside the jail and then every morning he would come in and then learn and then he'd go outside and he'd sleep outside the jail for the week and these people sleep in the streets in the slums and don't have food normally but that that's a big gig right um and he he was amazing he was like a superstar edward scissorhands has his own barbershop and he employs three people that is such a beautiful inspirational story it must make all of the hard work worth it and when you were talking about working 50 60 hours a week on your your you know your career and then another 40 volunteering it's hard work isn't it volunteering but it's so rewarding I mean what you do is beyond and I suppose it would just keep you going seeing those incredible results and the people that are so appreciative go on to do incredible things with their lives I don't think I've heard such a incredibly inspiring story before Selena thank you but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna take the praise because it's everybody that commits to hair aid it's it's the people that say you know what I'm going to do a fundraiser for you I'm going to raise $200 and help you buy a set of clippers for the Australian community cuts you know they leave their their family their wage their their life for a week come over fly to crazy places let me send them to jail or let me send them to the slums or you know ask Benny Tognini that about the time I said to him um your training location is in a graveyard this week and he was, that's because that's where the street people live. They live inside and underneath the old graves, you know, and he's like, okay. <laughs> I don't even know what to say. It sounds like you do need some help from the beauty and aesthetic industry. And I would love to offer promoting your service and what you do um, to our community to get you volunteers. 
I think you will find the beauty and aesthetic industry very, very generous with their time I have seen and we would definitely love to be a part of this and you've inspired me and I'm sure you're going to inspire lots and lots of beauty therapists and dermal therapists and and um, and nurses out there because we also have some nurses um, and medical professionals in our industry as well yes. so let's brainstorm about how we can get this happening yeah, absolutely. Look, we have a we have a global cutathon coming up on the first of August, and that's when we ask stylists to cut one haircut and donate that service to us. But I wonder if we can do a little gig like that for early next year for your industry, where it's just one service once a year and donate that money to Hair Aid so that we can continue doing the vital work that we do. I love um, that. I'll be yeah. in. Yeah, let's, let's make up, or well, I haven't even made up a, a name for that, but I'm sure your community can come up with a name with that. But like that, that's what we need. We need that support. You know, there's tools and resources that need to be done and there's all the fun stuff of um, insurances for Hair Aid and web pages and auditors and accountants that have to be paid just it's a it's still a business that needs you know funding let's create something new because together we can really change lives in ways that we can never really imagine and that's what we're about selena yeah. thank you so much for giving us your time today and sharing this incredibly meaningful project everyone listening if you want to get involved please reach out to us at info at the and also to Hair Aid. Thank you so much, Selena. It's been a pleasure talking to you today. Yes, thank you. And once again, thank you for your time. I do appreciate that, um, you know, being able to speak to such a wide audience is an honour and I'm thankful for you um, inviting me. You're so welcome. You've reached the end of another episode of the ABIC podcast, your online support community for the aesthetic and beauty industry. Thank you for listening and until next time, stay connected.